I just wonder how many guitars Paul's got on the road. Uh, five right now. Uh, two of them, three of them are in a regular tuning, which is like E flat, and then there's a couple weird tunings. He does. Um, who's Kiss's greatest guitar? Uh, that's hard to say because they're all so different, you know. All three of them have been really good and done a lot for the band. Um, but because their playing is so different, I don't think it's fair to say who's better. They all had their time and what they did. Eric is a great drummer, but they've all done a lot for the band. Yeah, how much music do you get on tour? That was the that I know of that would sit up here uh, no matter who the band is and just say ask whatever you want and that's exactly what they do they they have balls uh, I think they're great to work for so you know like I say I've worked with a lot of bands but these guys are uh, are tops <laughs> and that's not a politically correct statement that's the truth yeah Speak up a little more. What? Oh, I think they can better answer. Uh, the question was, is there, are there any ill feelings between Gene and Paul and the original members? But when they come up here, you can ask them that. They, they, uh, they have uh, very strong feelings for the original members. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the question for them to answer. Because, you know, there's uh, a lot of people want to know those things. And by the way, when they come up here, in a few minutes, when they come up here, they're just honest, they'll be down here in a minute, then you want to listen to me. But when they do come up here, um, you can ask them anything you want, but we do ask that when somebody's asking a question, everybody else respect them, please. Speak up so we can hear you, actually we'll pass the mic around. But let anybody answer any kind of question they want, and uh, any question is fair game. But, uh, you know, try it because we have a limited time. Try to make them questions instead of, you know, hey, how big is your tongue, you know. Make them questions that are interesting because they do have a lot to talk about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We like it. Um, and I just, you know, when we're coming uh, to the end of our tour also, and I know a lot of people have been through all the, uh, all the other shows, and all the other conventions and I just want to tell you, you guys have been great you've been very friendly and very hospitable and uh, we would like to thank you Okay, first question is down here, you guys. Um, 
God. Um, oh, wait, wait, everyone, it's not just me, everyone in the room is just so Stand goddamn up. honored to be here. Um, we know that it took, shut up. <laughs> we know that we haven't seen you guys in 15 years, but it's worth waiting for. It honestly is. Next question here. Um, it, what an honour, firstly. Secondly, I, I noticed on the Kiss My Ass, um, or Ass, <laughs> album, how come, I look on the cover and inside the insert, why did you hide Ace's face on every page? I found his face once. That's a good question. Is there anything behind it? Yes. And there was a question before, was there any ill feeling between Gene and Paul and the rest of the previous two bands? I'm not talking to him. <laughs> no, no, not between. Uh, that's a good question. What happened with Ace's makeup, obviously it wasn't uh, a fluke that all his pictures, unfortunately, we had to, to kind of mess up. What happened was, before we got ready to put the album out, and incidentally, since then, we've had dinner with Ace, and we've spent time with him, and spent time with Peter, and everybody's getting along just fine. You know, there's, there's, there's no problem. But around the time we were putting the cover together, some lawyer called us up and said that he represented Ace. And he said, um, you know, on behalf of my client, you can't do this, and you can't do that. Um, it's a load of shit, because you ask your question, now be quiet and hear your answer. Um, and it's really a load of shit, because if Ace had had a problem with anything, he certainly could have called us. We felt bad, and we've spoken to him since then. But no lawyer, no guy who wears a suit and tie is going to tell us, after 20 years, what we can or can't do. No! You know, we're, we're perfectly willing to speak to anybody who's been in the band, and let's face it, we wouldn't be here today had it not been for Ace and Peter being a member, you know, of the band originally. It's the four of us that started this thing. But um, no lawyer is going to tell us what we can or can't do. And if Ace ever wants to talk to us, or Peter, they know where to reach us. We've seen them since then, and everything's fine. Okay, the next question directly up the back opposite you. <laughs> Age very quickly, so uh, what's the secret? <laughs> <laughs> She's right there. I'm hiding up the back. Feeling like a spastic. Could you say the question one more time, please? Yeah. 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 Nice to know the secret um, to your good look. That rock and roll guys usually age very quickly because of the drugs and all that sort of stuff, but you guys look unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Music keeps us young, number one. Music keeps us young, yes. But uh, number two, I mean, we don't do drugs and we don't we don't dig all that stuff. It's, it's bullshit. And the, other, the other thing is, we're not the original guys in the band. We've been hired to fill in for that. Gene, uh, like 20 years you've been doing interviews, you've done all these conventions. Have you ever had an answer for a question no one's asked you? Like some insight into the band that no one's really asked you about? Like what? <laughs> you know, you get asked. You're asked questions all the time, and obviously the same questions repetitively. Have you ever had a question you wished you were asked, but no one's ever asked you, like, so you could just give a good answer towards it? Have I ever wished for a question to be asked that wasn't asked? <laughs> you have to excuse me, I'm not bright. I, it takes me a while. Actually, no, because uh, it almost doesn't matter what question is asked. If we've got something on our minds, we'll, we'll just start talking. For instance, they'll say, 
So tell us, uh, is it true that you're knights in Satan's service? And we would say, well, we're so excited about history, let me tell you all about it. And then you start answering the question that you wish was asked. Aloy! There we go. Firstly, I want to say, these are all legends and it's the best moment of my life. saying that the 80s weren't like you are, you are proud of it but it's not the best. I, I'm only 19 and I don't remember the 75 and 70s that much, but I thank Christ for crazy nights because I wouldn't have heard it. Uh, I wouldn't have heard about you guys for awesome for that. So I'd just like to know a little bit more why you think that wasn't such a good era for you guys. We all have different opinions about that, you know, for different reasons. And, I mean, obviously what's most important is what you think, but, you know, each one of us can tell you, you know, what we were doing, our, our assessment of what was going on in the 80s. I know Gene in particular was not very fond of the 80s. Hey! <laughs> yeah, guys, uh, my hand's pounding like 40 bastards, but I still want to answer this. Um, you, Stand up. You, got, you guys have released a, um, a series of autographed uh, copies of History in America. Will you guys uh, do anything like that for Australia? Maybe a limited 1,000 or something? We actually, we, uh, actually are planning so many exciting things. Um, and we're just trying to do them one, one step at a time and well. Here's the way it works. We actually brought one copy of History with us. And we'll, we will pass it around if you promise not to tear it up. There's only one that exists so far. The rest of the copies will be distributed. The uh, photos and stories from Australia will be showing up in... Everybody's got to listen to the answers when you ask, ask questions. Thank you. So uh, the stories that you see happening in the papers and so on, and especially the KISS conventions, will actually be showing up in KISS Nation, the forthcoming magazine that's going to be printed worldwide by Marvel. And uh, we intend on continuing to chronicle all this stuff because it's as much as your story as it's as much your story as it is ours. Yeah, the book's available for anybody anywhere in the world. You can get it internationally, so just gotta just gotta order it. Thanks, Chris. Okay. <laughs> and it's a good book too. Where is it? Where's our book? Okay, stage right. Has anyone ever thanked you for giving them the strength to buy your music to conquer a crippling injury? Wow. I'm sorry. Has anybody what? Has I anyone can't. ever said thank you to you for with your music helping them to conquer a crippling injury? <laughs> well, we uh, we usually don't um, hold press conferences about that, but you do what you can. I'm being very serious. But you do what you can. Uh, when somebody is in need, if they want you uh, to come over, and if we can, we certainly make it our our job to make sure that we show up and, and try to help. Without your sound, I wouldn't be standing on two legs today. I wouldn't even be walking, let alone dancing. Oh, so that? thank you. It's all right. Hey, I wanted to remind you, everybody, we got to keep it down when the questions are being asked because we can't hear. There's so many people in here, so everybody's got to make an extra effort to keep it down so we can hear. Um, I just wanted to know, like, were there many songs left off the 70s records? And if so, would there ever be a chance of them being released in the future? There, um, when we were recording during the 70s, we basically recorded an album's worth of material. There are demos, though, <clears throat> which are very cool. There's demos that'll be in the box set. Um, there's uh, all kinds of, you know, us playing with different people. So that kind of stuff exists, but there were no tracks left off. We used to record an album's worth of material. So people sometimes talk about unreleased Kiss tracks. There really aren't many of them. Okay, back on to the stage right. Before we go into the question, these guys back. Where are we? Uh, yeah. This is. Could everyone please sit down? None of us back here can see for a start. So 
I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. My oh, quick question for Eric. Um, how did you con the other members of the band into not having your hair black and curly and all that sort of stuff? Well, actually, I didn't have to con them into it. Um, I think they decided after uh, working after we worked together, I worked on the Revenge record, and uh, unfortunately, after the passing of the Barrett Carr, you know, they decided the band wanted to continue on, and they asked me to be the guy to help keep the Kiss Machine moving. So anyways, they decided, you know, times have changed. At one time, Kiss was a certain type of look to go with the makeup and all that, but it, it's not that cookie-cutter kind of mentality. And I also think for my own self, I had played with a lot of different people before. It, for me to have dyed my hair would have looked really hokey, because everyone's known me for a long time from other bands, at least like in America, and they would have said, you know, what are you doing? So. <laughs> He's a blonde member. Yeah, cool. Um, I want to say that it's been a lifetime dream to meet these guys or go close to it anyway. Um, I'm a big Eric Carr fan, but Eric, I mean, they definitely made the right choice for you, buddy. And, uh, also, Bruce, you're definitely the best guitarist I've ever had. Anyway, so you guys deserve just as much good. Yeah. Uh, you. And if you ever looking for a drummer to fill in, I'll be glad. Right, can I have a question for you? What is this uh, Gene 69 and all this stuff? What is that? What does it say below us? Oh, the number plates. Oh, okay, cool. 69. Eric, the 69 signifies. Oh, but I'm trying to figure out what it said below that. <laughs> now I just realize it's a license plate. It certainly wasn't yeah, the original. Sign it for us. Right. Um, who would we? Um, who would you like to tour with again? The Beatles. <laughs> when you ask questions, do us a favor because we're it's a little hard for us to see you and we want to make eye yeah, contact. Here. Yeah. Um, you know how to be The mic just went off. Um, they toured with like Bon Jovi and stuff, all them That's not true, they've toured with us. Yeah, yeah. It's like a bit, but all them bands have had home for you. Is there anyone you'd like to have back again if you had to do a final tour? Any band? Play for you? The Beatles. Do you mean, do you mean bands we've never played with before or new? We have ACDC. <laughs> Not because they're Australian, I don't give a shit. They're just a great band. And Gene's running for president in 96. <laughs> Okay. Next question's here, guys. Me. Oh, there you go. Okay. Hey. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Um, my first one is, what was it like in comparison, say, how it took you 12 years to get back to South America and 15 here? What was the crowd reaction like, say, between there and here after not being in each place for so long? Because I was in Melbourne the other night, and I swear to God, you kicked my ass from here the next week. Yeah! Yeah. Like, just, what was the reaction like with the crowds? Nothing's really changed. I mean, the, the coolest thing, the worst part about this whole thing was that we had to wait 15 years to come back here. Yeah. And, you know, some people have said to us, why did it take so long? And it had nothing to do with us being, you know, casual or, or, or nonchalant about Australia. The truth is, we couldn't come over here, believe it or not, because the promoters didn't think anybody wanted to see us. Yeah. The best thing that's happened this time, obviously, because of the turnout at the shows, is I think the promoters have finally listened to you, and I think you'll be seeing us real soon.
Where are we? Who's got the mic? Diga, where are you? Tell me if you want to use the mic, this one's being repaired. Yeah. Oh. Right. Is it something in the Is it something in the water here? Yeah. All right, send it over to me. I did. You just wanted us to see you. I thought each one of you is a rose, and I was wondering if I could give them to you. It didn't mean so much to me. obviously history and a lot more stuff and we're jazzed as hell and honored that you would even give us the time of day we appreciate it yes good day how's it going um first i'd like to say the first time i ever saw you was when i was six and i'm only 25 now so it was quite a while ago but um it was, uh, you can imagine the effect that had on a hyperactive kid who couldn't eat too much sugar with a vivid imagination. <laughs> anyway, thanks, thanks for the, the childhood, um, it was fantastic. My question, um, when you reached such a pinnacle in the, in the late 70s and plateaued off somewhat and, and the hardcore fans stuck by you, albeit a lot, um, perhaps departed, was there a sense of depression that permeated the band or did you strive on for, I mean obviously you did, thank you. <laughs> this, you know, this has never been the whole thing about what we do is not how big we are this year, it's not how many albums we sell. We started doing this in the beginning because we love what we do. And we're blessed to have anybody want to come see us. And the idea that if you're only selling 5 million albums instead of 10 million albums, we're doing damn well and we're thankful. 
And we're just going to continue doing this because this is what we love doing. What people say is it going to end? Fuck no. Thank you. How about the microphone over here? Yeah! It's broken, Gene. So we'll have to, maybe what we can do is we can take your mic, Gene, and pass it to a few people down in here. Go ahead, you're already standing. Go ahead. Now that mic's not working. It's crapped out. Here, Tommy. Cheap Aussie batteries. Check. There it goes. I'd just like to say my husband won one of the four videos that you personally signed and I think it's one of the biggest moments of his life, so thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I just want to know why you badmouth the Elder album so much because I think it's one of your best albums. Unfortunately, when you read things in the press, they're usually oversimplified, and uh, you know you get sound bites, and you think, "Ah, oh, Gene hates the Elder." It's not true. We think highly of the Elder. It's just that the mindset, the the frame of mind we were in when we were recording that record, wasn't really honest. We were more concerned with trying to impress media, reviewers, critics, people like that, than doing a record from our hearts. And so in that way, it was a warped KISS record. It really wasn't so much a KISS record. It was about as valid as somebody going up to you and pulling on your shirt and saying, look what I can do, look what I can do. So if, if the record is good and you like it, we're happy about that, but we know that it wasn't quite the record that came direct from our hearts. It was a little bit, I don't know, uh, we thought about it a lot. You know, there were scripts and lyrics, and there was even a blackboard. You remember the blackboard that we had, trying to sort of plot out the stories? And it was a very sort of thought about record, so it wasn't as spontaneous as most KISS records. So if we feel a little bit distanced from it, it doesn't mean we don't like it. It just doesn't seem as natural as a KISS record. Um, guys. Uh, it's a bit loud there. This way, over here. Hey, wait. Let's see where you are. Right here. Okay, thank you. Um, not so much a question as a statement. I just, I was just busting the subject. Um, the last time that you guys were out, I was like eight years old. I worked my ass off to get some tickets, and I was too young to go to the concert. Last year, this time, uh, we had uh, we were in LA, and we got word that uh, Gene and Paul were at, uh, at a 7-Eleven or something. And we scoured the city for hours trying to find you. I was thinking, man, when am I going to meet these idols? And, and like third time, lucky I guess. And um, it's just electric to see you guys um, live. And uh, thanks for the memories, thanks for the music, and love you heaps. Thanks. I love you. We're always at 7-Eleven if you ever want to meet us. <laughs> okay, we're back on. Hi guys. Um, I'd just like to say, um, I saw your first performance in Europe um, without makeup, and I must say I was shocked to death. But um, when we came on stage and kicked up, like you always do, I just fell in love all over again. Um, with you, Paul, of course. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd like to say that I'm absolutely in awe at this moment. Um, I've waited for this all my life. Um, and I just want to say, I love you all. Um, and, and I do have a question in case you're wondering. Um, I want to know... Um, <laughs> what you guys are doing tonight, after the show. You. <laughs> oh, down the front. Yeah, sorry, Down the front. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, I just want to say one thing. I was uh, there on the showground back in the 70s. You kicked ass there. Man, you're going to kick ass again tomorrow night. And I'm hanging for the next tour. You won't regret it. Now, yeah. Paul, down the front. front hey, guys. Front. I just want to ask a question I've been wanting to answer for a long time. 
the guitar audition with Ace, if Bob Kulik had hair, would he have been in Kiss? <laughs> he probably would have been happier if he had hair, but he wouldn't have been he wouldn't have been in Kiss. You know, Bob was a great guitar player, but he really wasn't he wasn't suited to be in the band, and it was so clear when Ace walked in. I mean, if you talk about magic, you know, it was Peter and Gene and myself playing, and we were playing things like Deuce and that kind of stuff, and all of a sudden this weird guy walks in. We're just finishing up with Bob, and we're talking to him, and this weird guy with one red sneaker and one orange sneaker comes walking into the room and plugs in his guitar and starts playing. We were gonna kill this guy, but as soon as he started playing, there was such magic between the four of us that uh, Bob became a friend and uh, it was just a matter of fate and time before Bruce joined and Bruce yeah! is, is what Ace was in the beginning. Yeah. Oh, just, just one question for Jim over here. To the left, to the right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed the, the movies that you made and I was wondering if in the future you're going to make any more movies. You know, the perfect villain. <laughs> Uh, actually, tonight I'm going to do some home movies. <laughs> hey guys, how's it going? Before I go on, I just want to do this. A uh, um, couple, couple of months ago, I met Alice Cooper. That was pretty big, but this is just fucking awesome, alright? <laughs> My heart's pounding, hang on. Ooh, ooh. Okay. Um, I just want to ask one quick question. Um, you did some solo stuff in the 70s now. Can we expect some um, solo stuff for the 90s, for you guys, especially for Bruce and uh, Eric? Maybe just do a full, maybe another solo set there. That'd be great. I don't know. I don't know if you guys can sing, but hey, you can play guitar and play drums. I sing in the shower. That's about it. No, we're all really committed to the band. We're solo records. Just. Uh, they're not a priority right now, and then both Gene and Paul, I know, you know, they get asked that a lot, and it's not something that's important at all. I mean, I did a, a, a solo track for, a, you know, an instrumental thing for a record with all just guitarists on it, and that was fun. To be honest, do, am I interested in doing a whole record like that? Not really. I'd rather, you know, just stay working on Kiss material and work with the band. The four of us work together really well. It just works, and individually, everybody is just not that interested. You also have to remember that if we do if we do solo albums, it means that we're saving material that might be good for Kiss. Once you start doing solo albums, you start putting material aside, and that's not that's not really what's best for Kiss. At this point, it's really important that we put all our energy so that we can do an album like Revenge, only even better than that. Uh, just one more thing. I was asking. I just wanted to uh, get a favor of you guys. I'm really nervous. Um, can I get my picture taken with you guys? It's like a dream of mine. <laughs> especially with you, especially with Gene. It's like uh, the reason I started playing bass in my band was because of Gene. The only, <laughs> the only problem is that everybody here wants to get their. Yeah, but I was the first. <laughs> here, in case you don't know what's going to happen, what we're going to do is we're going to spend a lot of time with you. First, we're going to exhaust everything you want to know about us. We'll stay and we'll play unplugged. If you can remember a song title, we'll try to remember the song. And then, and then afterwards, we're going to stick around. We want to be with you, talk with you, sign anything you want us to sign. We're not going away. We will be here. You'll get your photo. I didn't realize how hard this was going to be once I stood up. Um, again, I'm. We happen to all be in a, a band ourselves and probably wouldn't be in that situation we are, we are now uh, if it wasn't for you guys. I'm uh, the singing guitarist, bass player and other guitarist. Uh, it's basically a hard rock concept show. Uh, we do some of your stuff. What's the band called? Metal Storm, hard rock show. Um, and if it wasn't for you guys, we definitely wouldn't be doing it and where we are now. Thanks very much. We're over here. Hi. 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 You gotta take turns, man. Guys, I'm um, looking to Australia, Sydney. Wave your arms so we all see you. There Stars you. and Stripes here. All right. Um, I want to say that um, you've been a great influence in my life, uh, musically. Uh, but Paul, I've got a question for you. In Melbourne, at the convention, you gave some of your hair chest to uh, in a little bottle, plastic bottle, to uh, a guy called Critty. Do you remember? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. There he is. 
What does he want today? You want me to pee in a bottle? <laughs> This is a good friend of mine, and um, he showed us the video that went down to Melbourne, and, and something to drink. You've seen his pants before. Uh, you're telling Paul on the plane about his pants. Do you remember that? I did what with his pants? You, you're, looking at it, you're looking at his pants, and your, your fantasy is like, you wanted um, to you take a picture of it? You, you wanted a picture of it. Oh, oh, oh. I didn't fantasize about his pants. I wanted to take a photo of it to put into Kiss Nation. Right? Well, yeah. Well, I just want to say that. Hopefully, you kick ass tomorrow night. Okay? Hey, um, I just like to say, well, everyone else has said everything there is to say. I love you, all. You're all great. Um, I was always wondering about Eric Carr. He did some artwork, some cartoons. Um, are we ever going to see anything like that? Yeah, the, the Rockheads is what you're talking about, yeah. which was these. Uh, you know, animated, it, ultimately there were drawings that he made with a concept of it being like a Saturday morning cartoon show, which was very cool, and uh, I know the parents are gonna give it to us actually so that we can display it, and we're gonna feature some of it in the Kiss Nation, which is gonna be that like bi-yearly magazine that we're gonna put out. So you guys are gonna see what, Eric, what was on Eric's mind. He was very creative, it was some cool stuff actually. It was like parodies of himself and girls that he went out with. It's really a trip. I mean, the one time I saw it, I was I was blown away. All these characters, all these rockheads, look just like Eric. I mean, they had hair. <laughs> Eric, when he would walk into a room, his hair came in before him. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to say again, thanks for everything. Last <laughs> night, uh, hi fellas. Um, I had a chance to see you in Adelaide and Melbourne, and um, uh, three quick questions. Um, what happened to the kiss condoms? Um, you need one right now. <laughs> Why aren't they selling them there? What's, what's the story with them? We, uh, we do have kiss condoms. We uh, unfortunately didn't bring them here. I don't know why. We, we Did you use them all? <laughs> um, but uh, we, fall, we... I have to interrupt you, Gene. You're always phoning everybody up in the middle of the night. He sends Andre on the prowl looking for scumbags. That's good. <laughs> um, secondly, I had a chance to see you on the Revenge Tour. Now, um, the most exciting part of that tour was that during War Machine, the skull breaking off the hand and everything. Why wasn't that shown on Kiss Confidential? That section there. We, you, the truth of it is that um, we didn't get good footage of it. The footage, you know, you, you, the law of averages, that's something that's real important. You're not going to get on tape. Literally, we didn't get we didn't get that properly done. So there was just no way for us to use it. And thirdly, does Andre ever smile? <laughs> does Andre ever smile? No. <laughs> uh, Andre is uh, our security guy, the cute guy over here. <laughs> Smiles. See that Andre? That theme song's become legendary. Thanks a lot. He's actually very funny, but not with you. Thanks a lot, fellas. Kick ass tomorrow night. Definitely. First, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for letting kids stand for their rights in the 80s. If it wasn't for you guys, kids would never stand for their rights in the 80s. And also, is the new album going in the same musical direction as uh, Revenge did? Yeah, it's going to be an extension of Revenge. Um, you know, when people have asked us to try to describe some of the stuff on it, it's very, very heavy. Some of it's pretty dark sounding. And then somebody goes, oh, you're not going to become a grunge band. No, we're not. You won't see any shorts on stage. We're not going to go out in flannel. We're not going to suddenly become... We're not going to be in Seattle. We're, we're going to stay true to you know who we are. And we're just going to take the next step forward. But I think you're going to really like it. Regarding the Kiss My Ass album again, now, was there any bands that sort of you guys wanted to be on there that weren't? Yeah, Missing in Action, it says it right on the record. Those were a lot of bands that wanted to participate. Unfortunately, politics sometimes get involved, you know, with the other record companies, where they don't want their artists being on other labels' like records. Like, like, like Ozzy, he was, Stone Temple, he was gonna do, he was gonna do a song with Stone Temple Pilots. Actually, Gene can tell you all the groups that were. Nine Inch Nails. Nine Inch Nails. Here, here were some of, the, uh, some of the real killers that could have happened, except that the suits, got in the way. 
We had Stowe Temple Pilots and Ozzy Osbourne doing a duet on Watching You. We have Alice in Chains doing Larger Than Life. War Machine by Soundgarden. Love Gun by uh, Nine Inch Nails. Dr. Love by Kurt Cobain. Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth and two other members that they were going to put together. Uh, rock, and, rock and Roll All Night by Sir Mix-A-Lot. We had uh, Cypress Hill, House of Pain, on and on and on. Which one were the Beatles going to do, Gene? <laughs> <laughs> but, but we're, you know, honestly, the fact that, that any other artist that, who writes his or her own material would even give us the time of day is the greatest honor. And the fact that there's a, a Kiss My Ass album, sorry, Kiss My Ass album <laughs> at all is, you know, it's way beyond anything we ever hoped for. So we have no regrets at all. We're Kylie happy. Minogue, who was going to be on. <laughs> Rolf Harris, he was going to be Just wondering what, um, what... Wait, you're, we're having problems with the mics today. I'm just wondering what you guys are listening to now. Other bands and stuff like that. What bands are you doing at the moment? Emerson Lake and Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I think everybody has got their ears open without it really affecting who and what we are. But let me see, I like, uh, I think Trent Reznor is a very bright guy who does very credible stuff. Uh, I think some of the best pop songs being written are being done by the Cranberries. I love the sort of, uh, I think Green Day and Offspring are both terrific new bands. There's a lot of very good music out there. Pantera, I love Pantera. And Eric, you still pimping for Jane? Am I still what? Pimping for Jane? <laughs> Am I still pimping for Jane? Actually, not as much anymore. Um, I, those duties have kind of been taken over by Andre. <laughs> Actually, Andre's just a liaison. He's not really the pimp. How do you guys know all this stuff? <laughs> How's it going guys? Welcome to Australia. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to know, speaking of like bands doing cover songs and everything, uh, with Hard to Believe and Kiss My Ass, I just wanted to know, we were getting told before that you guys do covers when you're doing sound checks, mate. What's your favourite cover song? What do you like performing the best? Well, we do, lots of times we'll do some old Zeppelin stuff just for fun. Paul sings that stuff great, you know. Great oh. And I gotta say, he does the leads real good. Most people don't know Paul, you know, does play leads. And on some of the Kiss records, there's a lot of leads that were done by Paul. So it, wasn't all, it wasn't always Ace in the older days, but he does that old Zeppelin stuff really cool. Yeah! yeah I just wanna know if um, you guys would mind playing like a cover tomorrow night so we can actually see that. No. Everybody here realizes that if we play somebody else's song, that's one song less of ours, and we want to play. Yeah. Yeah. We're playing on at least one four, one five songs. You know, the show tomorrow night isn't going to be one of these ego festivals where each guy goes out and spends ten minutes playing a solo while everybody else walks off the stage. We'll play at least twenty four songs, twenty five songs. Wow. We'll be on stage yeah. for two hours. Okay, you're right here. I got a mic. Alright. Um, I'd just like to ask um, to Gene and Paul. Um, during the uh, period when Vinnie Vincent left and Mark St. John had all that trouble with his hands, um, was there any time that you two just thought, oh, fuck it, I just don't want any more? <laughs> Honest, honestly, no. Uh, we've had. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Mark St. John, who's a nice guy, incidentally, um, didn't stay with the band longer than a year or so. Uh, Vinny Vincent was almost two years. But, you know, between all the comings and goings, if anything would have brought, uh, broken us up, it would have been Eric Carr's death, which was emotionally the biggest blow we ever had. Ultimately, I think we, we uh, look to each other for strength and to see whether or not you know the, the spirit of the band is alive and ultimately I think we all realize that the spirit of KISS is bigger than any one individual no matter what happens and that the best thing we can do for you and for us is to continue as long as it feels good in our hearts 
never once, through all the ups and downs of the band, did we ever think of calling it quits. And we're still having a good time. We continue. <laughs> Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you continued. And um, one more thing, you guys just fucking rock. You're the ultimate. And um, I'm gonna be in LA in June. I need a place to stay. Um, do, you mind, do you mind if I just crash at your house? How about Andre's house? Oh uh, no, it's all right. You just, you just fixed up your guest house. I think you could stay there. Yeah. <laughs> Question for everybody. Um, the Elder album you used Bob Esrin, and the last album you also used Bob Esrin. Who's producing the ne next album? We would have liked to have used Bob, and it's still kind of up in the air whether or not he's going to be available to work with us. Um, we want somebody involved with us, but it always gets difficult because there's loads of people who want to do albums with us, but we've been doing this a little too long to have somebody come in and take them seriously if they don't have a real history. So. Um, if Bob's not available, we're looking at some other people. But, um, you know, it, it's difficult for us to do it ourselves. It's good to have some input, but you want somebody you respect. Great tattoo. Great tattoo. we got to get a photo of that. <laughs> tattoo. <laughs> okay, back on the right hand side. In the early 80s, you did some um, co-writing with Desmond Child. Uh, did you actually discover Desmond, who went on to write on some other hits? What was the story there? Desmond was uh, in a very cool band that used to play around New York City. And uh, I used to go see his band because he had three girls in it. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, we just started writing. Uh, I think the first, the first thing we probably wrote was, I was made for loving you. And then over the years, you know, we wrote stuff like Heaven's on Fire, and then at some point, uh, John Bon Jovi was looking for somebody to co-write with, and I said, you know, give this guy a call. So that worked out, and I really haven't seen Desmond. Um, he hasn't done anything with us for a long, long time. I think at this point, we're very clear on what we want to do, and when everybody is focused on what we're doing, there's no reason to really include too many outside people, especially people who make a profession of songwriting. Um, secondly, um, Gene, to you, what's the most weird request you ever had from a fan? <laughs> sure, everyone here. Was. An unmentionable one, obviously. The strangest question <clears throat> or request? Wow, you know the obvious one. Will you have my baby? That stuff. <laughs> from a guy. <laughs> check, check, check. Okay, back here, and we'll we'll come. Uh, Right there, check, check, check. Then we'll come back to, this, to the center here. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, being on the road together for the last six, seven years, I was just wondering, Paul, what annoying habits do the other three have that you found out through touring with them? All their habits are annoying. Can you give us an example? He, everybody's different, you know. Um, Eric likes, Eric, I've never seen anybody who has more energy than him. I mean, he's, He's a, a classic case of hyperactivity, and uh, Bruce, Bruce is, there's nothing bad about Bruce except if he doesn't get fed. <laughs> if he doesn't get fed, he's like a, like a weasel or like a rat, and he just gets very, very angry. But I mean that in a good way. And I mean that in a good way. But, you know, Bruce is like so even-tempered that as soon as he gets out of control or gets nasty, you know he hasn't eaten. And um, Gene, let's see. Gene talks a lot. <laughs> He's a slob. That's <laughs> true. I'm a pig. There's always jelly or ketchup on his clothes. <laughs> you should see these two. The funniest thing, Bruce and Gene should live together. Because Gene, Gene eats couple. and drops food on the floor and Bruce cleans up. <laughs> in his room. True. I've got a question for all of you. Um, I have been to the convention in Melbourne. I've done right. both concerts there. Yeah. They were absolutely fantastic concerts. Thank you. Um, I think there's quite a few people from Melbourne here that are pretty much attested over. Um, number one, in the second concert, why did there seem to be a few fuck ups? During Lick It Up, number one. There were. Yes, there were. They just seemed to be, a lot of them were fairly well covered, but um, they were picked up. 
Bruce hit it on the head. We're human, you know. Um, we we lost it on Lick It Up. That was actually my fault. Um, we take turns once in a while making mistakes. Number two, which concert out of the two Melbourne concerts would you say was the better one? First one. Create re reaction wise. We're mixed on that. I think the first one. I know yeah. most of you guys like the second. Yeah. The first one had a great crowd. Yeah. Really good. Oh, I thought the first as well. The second concert was just. I don't know whether it was the people we were sitting with or what. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. You know, it's, it, this is this is the kind of thing that uh, is important to us because nobody else tells us the truth. You know, it's, we're serious about this. By talking to people like you, we find out when it's good, when it's bad, when we're full of shit, when we're not. People around us always tell us we're great. Any girl you ever meet, oh, you're a legend, legend, legend. You know, all that stuff. Twenty-four hours a day, you tell us the truth, and we appreciate it. Back to you. Hello. Yeah, I'm over here. Where? Stanley, is that you? <laughs> Down here. Right outside oh, there. You go. there you go. How's it going, boys? It's good to see you down here after 15 years. I missed the first concert because my parents refused to give me um, my pocket money for a few weeks. Tough life. Gene, personal question. Have you ever kept in contact with that girl from Edmonton with the green hair? The studio best girl, you know the... Tell us the story. It's a good one. Um, no, actually I never saw her again. And uh, saw her again, not saw her again. I never saw her again. And um, maybe it's better that way. You know, for me it'll always be a memory forever. It's romantic and all that. And uh, they're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am romantic. <laughs> and I, I treasure that evening, and uh, all I remember is that she had green hair and beautiful fucking tits. I, I remember something about that night. Gene, this was when Gene was probably starting off taking photos, and this girl said to him, if you're going to take a photo of me, let me take a photo of you. So Gene, she said, um, I promise I won't show anybody. And of course, the next day, she showed us all this photo of Gene with little Jimmy. <laughs> and that was the last time you took a photo. Do you remember, do you remember, do you remember that? I remember. I was, uh, I looked like some psycho huddled in the corner of a bathroom floor naked. I remember. That was the, the one and only time. Tell him the story about Eric Carr. Eric Carr did something like that. <laughs> it, it, the photo is in is in history, by the way, because I saved it from the English press. But basically, he, some girl uh, who w wrote for the paper said, "Oh, I want to do a story on you guys, you know." And, and apparently, Eric liked her, thought she was sexy. Winds up, she's in his room. They're drinking champagne. Next thing you know, he's in the bathtub, naked. Okay, and she's like, "Oh, let me take a picture. I won't use it, really, you know." And sure enough. There's a photo of like, you know, Eric with a big head of hair, <laughs> barely, the, I'm sorry, the top barely covered his nuts. <laughs> there was a melody maker, kiss this. You know. <laughs> it's like the old, uh, I promise I'll pull out, you know. So. <laughs> I promise, just a little bit, I promise. I only want to put it in a little. Oh, hey guys, over here. Yeah, when? <laughs> First of all, I was in Melbourne as well, and I'd like to thank uh, Tommy and Paul Drennan for putting on the conventions and running them so smoothly, so I think these guys deserve a bit of a hand too, eh? <laughs> and I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Singer up there for being so accessible in Melbourne and uh, hanging out and having a chat to everybody. It was super cool. And uh, thanks, Eric. It was really cool. You're welcome. And one question I want to ask, there's been a lot of rumour, a lot of innuendo about the Creatures of the Night album. Can you guys set it straight as to the cover and who actually played the guitar parts on that album? That's a good question. <laughs> there, there is no one guitar player on that record. Ace was having uh, some problems creatively with the band and also I think emotionally he was going through a phase where he felt it was time to leave. 
even though for the record, we keep saying this year in and year out, Ace was always given the opportunity to do solo records and stay within the band. It was never a choice. Ace simply wanted to move on. So during that record, Ace never played a lick on the record, not a chord, never showed up for a single, uh, a single session. We had, we had people like um, Rick Derringer, Bob Kulik, um, Robin Ford. Robin Ford was a blues player out of Los Angeles. Richard, I mean, um, what was the kid's name? Steve Ferris, who was in Mr. Mr. for a week. Vinnie Vincent. <laughs> and Vinnie Vincent, who was at that point was not Vinnie Vincent. His name was Vinnie Cusano. That's right. You see, you know all the questions. And uh, we, the, the honest to God truth is, we decided to take a photo with Ace, and Ace was sensitive to this too, is because we all knew that even though it looked like Ace was about to leave the band, both we as a band and Ace individually was very sensitive to the fact that he did, he nor we did, we didn't want to, I don't know, we were concerned about the way you felt. And uh, we all decided, well look, let's figure out what's going to happen later. For now, let's take a photo together and keep the, the integrity of the band together for the fans. And the second cover, if you're talking about that one, uh, it was really, I mean, by the time I joined the band, we used to do a lot of songs from Creatures of the Night. The record company has this brilliant idea, oh, you know, we can push the sales by changing the cover, put the, the current band on the cover, which, I, you know, I didn't think it was particularly a great idea, but that's what they wanted to do. And, uh, you know, we, we see it as a mistake, but it really came about just solely from the record company saying, hey, we'll, we'll sell more copies with a reissue with a new, new cover. I, I prefer the original one, too. It has the right vibe for that album. Okay, question up for the right hand slide. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hit the microphone, it's not working. Hit it hard. Yeah. There you go. Oh. <laughs> no. It's working. Yeah to know if you're a God gave rock and roll to you, especially for Bill and Ted, the movie. We actually didn't, um, we, wrote, we rewrote the lyrics and rearranged the song, but it was actually a song that came out in the late 60s by a group called Argent, and it was written by uh, Rod Argent and uh, Russ, Russ, Ballard. Ballard. Russ Ballard. So we rewrote the words, and it was a, it was a song that we remembered, um, and we just thought it would be a really cool song, so we kind of made it our own, and if, you, if anybody's interested, you can pick up an album by a group called Argent, which is probably out of print, but if you get this album... Yeah, it was on, it was on the album Ar Argent in Deep is the name of the album. It shows the guys underwater, like in a pool, swimming. So I remember when they called me up to play on that song. Paul was ever doing this song, and he told me the name, and I was like, oh, cool, because I was actually an Argent fan, so I was totally aware of the song when they first mentioned it. Okay, next question over here on the left. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Bruce, I was wondering with whether you're going to do another Hot Mix video at all, because I've got your first one, I thought it was terrific, it helped me a lot. And uh, to, the, to all of you, whether um, you thought Ace's version of Hide Your Heart was any good, and what do you think of Peter and Ace's stuff since? Well, the, to answer the video question, I don't, I don't have a real burning desire to do another one. That was great, and sometimes I think about it, and I go, you know, everything's been done. I mean, there are all these people putting out instructional videos, but you know, everyone's been asking, so if I can think of an angle that's cool that I really think is going to help, um, you know, people who want to learn something, then maybe I'll do one. But there's no plans right now. Ace's version of uh, Hide Your Heart, I told him, was the best other than ours. You know, there was like four or five people that did that song. And his version was real good. Um, who else? As far as what they've done since they've left the band, or is that what you were asking? I think Ace... You know, there's no denying that Ace really set the road and set a course that a lot of guitar players have a lot that they owe him because Ace really, really came up with a style that a lot of people have copied since. I don't think that Ace's strongest suit is writing. And the problem with a lot of his albums is that he wrote a lot of the material. And Ace is more the kind of guy who can write one or two good songs for an album. And I think he does himself a disservice by doing all his own material. And Peter, <laughs> Peter's a nice guy. 
I think we've got to say this for the record. All of us uh, really agree that despite the fact that over the long haul, ACE, I think we all agree, hasn't been able to come up necessarily with the material. Uh, on the other hand, you've got the glaring reality of the Ace Fraley solo record, which is probably the best of all four solo records. So on, one hand, so on one hand, you've got Ace coming up with just a steamroller of an album, and uh, then over the course of time, when he was left to his own devices, maybe, you know, not as good. Sorry? I like Rock Soldier. That's one, that's one good song. <laughs> what about Peter's album? Feel Like Heaven was very good. <laughs> you know, uh, can I address the microphone holders? Can we get the microphones in the middle, please? Don't be in the center. After this, Tommy, can you try to get through the crowd? Because we got people over here who are being neglected. Okay. Um, other than Peter Chris's solo album, I only have a problem with one Kiss album in particular. It's hotter than hell, mainly because of the sound of it. There's some great songs on it, but songs like Going Blind, Strange Ways, Watching You, I think they can be improved if they were re-recorded. Oh, 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 oh. No, I, I, I think they're great songs, but the drum sound is just a bit too muffled on that, yeah, on that I mean, album. It's, it's terrible. You know, some of the earlier stuff may not be technically the best sounding, but that is part of the personality of those records and the idea of going in. Even if you can do it, even if you can make something sound better, doesn't mean you're doing it better. You know, the magic of those songs was those people playing at that time. And, you know, as far as we're concerned, when something when something isn't broken, you don't fix it. Uh, this question is for Paul, Jean, and Eric. I exclude Bruce because I think you're married, Bruce, aren't you? Yes. So is Paul. I'm married. Okay. There's something no one in this room probably knew, did they? Yeah. Okay. How do you get away with it? <laughs> How do you get away with get, like, getting married a uh, life on the road? So that's probably a question for Bruce as well. And Jean, the question is you can answer this together. Uh, Jean, um, has there been any person in one point in time where you've actually thought, well, I'd settle down for this person? Has there been any person? Any, person, any woman that you thought, I'm going to settle down. Any this. what? Woman, person. Oh, I thought you said person. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's a fair question. I'll try to ask, answer it honestly. I emotionally, I'm attached possibly forever with the mother of my children, who's just a wonderful, just, just a great girl, and I'm crazy about her, and probably always will be. But the idea of uh, marriage is really not for me. I mean, I don't want to do the joke, you know, marriage is an institution and you've got to be nuts to be in an institution. And, you know, I don't want to do that stuff. But I'm not sure I could live up to the oath where you stand in front of somebody and say that I'll never look or want another woman for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm not that good. I can't help it. Get that girl up here and she says, can I see your tongue? Can you put it in here? I go, all right. <laughs> I promise to pull out, I promise. <laughs> uh, guys, just wondering if you've ever played any role-playing games, and if you have... <laughs> What's it? <laughs> role-playing games. Role-playing? <laughs> How sick do you want to get? <laughs> you know, I have to tell you, there was one birthday party. It's in, the, it's in Kiss Street. Uh, in honor of Paul, we all dressed up like women. <laughs> and it's a beautiful, I make a stunning blonde, what was that? An orange uh, afro woman. Yeah. Is that what you mean? No. I don't think so. <laughs> Did you say role playing? Role playing. You know, it's sexual exploits, Gene. Oh. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? 
right. There you go. These guys are gods. I love you. And anyone that bags these guys don't belong in this room here tonight. So when you guys over there saying this album shit, this album shit, kiss my ass. Now, I know Bill a coin, is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah. Uh, he had a lot to do with the early development and he stayed with us for a long time. What happened to the guy? He seemed to just disappear. Good question. First of all, anybody here that doesn't like any of our albums, we need to know that kind of stuff. It's good, you know, the only kind of thing that we don't want, if somebody says we're great all the time, it's not true. And it's more it important is. that people tell us there are albums that aren't as good as other ones. We know it and sometimes you can tell us. You know, we're not offended. I mean, we're here to, you know, to hear the truth, not to, not to have everything sugar-coated. But um, as far as Bill O'Coin, Bill was there in the very beginning. Um, when we were playing around New York City, and he had never managed a band before, but it felt really good when we started working with him. And uh, we stayed with him up until around Creatures. And then Bill was having the same kind of problems that a lot of people in the rock and roll, you know, um, circus tend to have. And those problems tend to make your decision making a little fuzzy, um, whether it's um, drugs or you know just uh, whatever kind of poison you put into your body and at that point we just felt it was time to say goodbye you know we had some great times together but we've always felt that we should decide when this is over and we got a long way to go yet and when people start to pull us down you try to save people that are drowning but when they start to drown you you cut them loose um, I just wanted to ask have you got a, a a memory of Eric's, Eric Carr's favourite song, and is there any song that you do that sort of uh, brings back the emotive memories of him? I, uh, <clears throat> I would have to say God gave rock and roll to you. I saw, I mentioned this to Bruce um, yesterday, I saw God gave rock and roll to you, the video, um, last night, and I, I was watching it and completely forgot didn't even enter my mind that uh, Eric at the time was really in the last stages of his uh, cancer. He was very close to death. And uh, afterwards, I, uh, I turned the TV off. Um, God gave rock and roll to you probably more than the other song. All the way to the end, Eric was in Kiss. He was uh, suffering very, very badly. And uh, he begged for the chance, even though he didn't play on the song, to appear in the video and played his heart out. Bruce even made a comment about how uh, during the performance of the song, Eric was just banging those drums away, you know, really hard and, you know, outperformed Bruce, he thought. And uh, probably God gave rock and roll to him more than any of the song. Yeah, that's him singing too. I gotta say that um, I think Eric always liked Little Caesar because it was somewhat autobiographical, uh, autobiographical, exactly. and uh, that is his voice, by the way, on God Gave Rock and Roll. You know, in the a cappella section, if the, you listen for like this Beatley voice, it's Eric. You listen real hard, you can definitely hear it. He loved doing Black Diamond, also. You know, um, yeah, Eric can do it. does it great too. Well, you'll, you'll be the judge. <laughs> I'm going to go What? What? Just, uh, why didn't Eric Carr do more songs? Uh, let, let's do it for the record. For the record is, Everybody is encouraged and in fact pushed, pressured, to sit down and come up with material. Bruce, you know, originally joined the, the band as, you know, I'm just going to play lead guitar and stuff. And, I mean, he'll, he'll be the first to tell you, from day one it was like, have you got any riffs? Can you, can you write? Can you sit? Can you play? Eric Singer, who's sitting next to us here, I mean, this is really the beginning stages for him, but he's getting the pressure now. Start writing, come up with stuff. Let's, let's not just be sort of musicians, let's be more than that. And the very same thing holds true when 
Peter Chris joined the band, he was just a drummer. We pushed him to write material. When Ace Fraley joined the band, he just wanted to play guitar. Songs came out of him, and Eric Carr as well. When Eric Carr first joined the band, he was just a drummer, and we noticed that he was noodling on guitar, and we sat down and, and brought material out of him. Under the Rose, on the very first record that he joined, he was, he was on the record. But that doesn't mean, incidentally, that just because somebody can write songs that all, all, automatically you get songs and you get to sing stuff on the record, it's got to be good stuff. And uh, all of us run the gauntlet. Hell, I, I mean, 90% of my tunes die a fiery death before they ever get on the record. And so uh, everybody's got to work hard and the stuff that we think is the best stuff appears on the record no matter who writes it. I hope that answers the question. It's a crazy idea to think that because you write songs, you should have them on the album. The people that would get cheated would be you. I mean, you want the best songs, not songs just because somebody writes songs. I mean, we have to decide what makes the most sense and what gives you what you deserve. Not, well, if somebody wrote a song, let's put it on the album. Every song that goes on means one doesn't go on. Oddly enough, Eric wrote some real Beatle-y type stuff, which didn't always fit whatever album we were doing, you know. So, he had a song on Brian Adams, though. And actually, yeah, he co-wrote something with Brian Adams. Don't leave me lonely. Right. So the, that's guy, could, the guy could write. Yeah. That's at the time. I'll tell you how, once Eric got the bug, uh, Brian Adams was brought in as a co-writer before his career really got started. And he co-wrote uh, Rock and Roll Hell and Saint War Sin and yeah. War Machine. And uh, Eric pulled him aside and said, let's write a song together. And the song they wrote, incidentally, we didn't feel was right for us, but we thought it was good. Brian <laughs> went and put it on his record. It was on a big multi flat in the mouth. Well, quick question for Jay. Hey. What um, gave you the idea for World Without Heroes? Uh, it didn't start, what gave me the idea for World Without Heroes? It was not my idea. It started as a uh, song that Paul was working on called Every Little Bit of Your Heart. And uh, it didn't seem to fit what we were working on. What happened? It didn't seem to fit what we were working on with the elder. And uh, through a combination of myself, Paul, Bob Ezrin, and uh, Lou Reed, who was brought in to co-write stuff, uh, we came up with it, and incidentally, World Without Heroes was a line that Lou Reed had written on a piece of paper. I think it may have been me who said, gee, that's a cool idea for a song, let's, you know, develop that idea. But it was Lou Reed's title, called A World Without Heroes. There's, yeah. no, there's, there's no mic up here, which makes Hello. Sense. Oh. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, I just want to say thanks for coming out again. Um, I just want to ask a question, I mean, like you guys don't have uh, the costumes that you used to have. I mean, it must be a, a relief to sort of just jump up on stage and with about five minutes preparation now. I mean, can you sort of give us an insight on the preparation with the, the big costumes and that? I mean, what was it like? Did it sort of transform you? I, uh... Next generation, kiss me. We, uh, you know, everything in its right place, every um, part of your life makes sense as you're living it, you know? So at the time, at the point we were putting on the, uh, the makeup and the costumes, it was an awful lot of work, but we didn't, we weren't aware of it. It was too much a part of our life. It was who we were at that point. So even though we had to get there two hours before the stage set to put on the outfits, the makeup, and so on, we were, happy to do it and we felt it was right and now that we don't wear makeup and those outfits it doesn't negate what we did back then nor do we feel that it's a relief it's just who we are now and who we were then I just hold on a second we got we have people out there with mics and you gotta like really wait your turn because that's the whole idea of this was to have tommy and paul walk on the mic so you gotta respect everybody okay Hi guys, love you all. Um, this is for Bruce and Eric. Uh, you joined after the makeup came off. I was just wondering what the makeup would be uh, if, you were on, if it was still on today. Oh. <laughs> what do you want to be, Eric? I don't know. That would be up to uh, you guys to decide, you know. 
No, I, actually, um, it's, it's ironic that the original costume that they had for Eric Carr originally was a hawk. And I didn't know this at the time, but one time uh, somebody asked me that when I first joined the band, and I said a hawk, and then some kid in America when we were on tour drew a caricature of the band, how the band today would look with makeup, and he had me as a hawk and Bruce as the sorcerer with like a crystal ball, I don't know what that was all about, <laughs> whatever. It was a toilet bowl, I don't know. <laughs> you know, that's the, the, really the, the mystery or the, the mystique really about the four original guys. It was really tough for them to get an Eric Carr, you know, you've heard of that and you saw what happened and you saw it out there in the uh, costumes. And uh, even Vinnie Vincent, it was, it was a t it's a tough thing. You know, I don't know what I'd be. I always, you know, goof around and say I'd be the dog or something like that. But uh, that's part of why um, that was really special for the band. And now the band's moved on. Thank God we don't have to think about, really think about that too much. Thank you. Um, it's all, yeah, yeah, sorry, Paul. Um, uh, I'm here by myself tonight because my best friends do think I'm a jerk for liking and kiss. Uh, but You're in with a lot of jerks. To Jane, I read a bit. We don't get Put it up to your mouth. Let us hear what you say. That's what she said last night. Uh, no, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. Jane, we don't get much information down here about Kiss, and we sort of scrape for it. Um, I heard a bit about, on your solo album, um, that you actually invited the Beatles to play. Yes. Is that, can you tell us a bit about that? I was out of my mind <laughs> <laughs> and thought, you know, the world we were living in, you, 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 a couple of years before that, we were starving on the streets of New York and then all of a sudden you own the world. And I was really affected by it. I. I never thought I was stupid and I thought I was sort of above drugs and booze and all that stuff, but, but it, nothing, could pre nothing could prepare your mind for being completely drugged, you know, by, by fame and pow the power of it all. And uh, I thought anything I thought of would just happen. And so I went and rang everybody in the world because, I don't know, somehow it was my chance if you feel like you, this is special for you, like you get a chance to be with us, I wanted that feeling. I never met anybody. You know, when I was growing up, the Beatles or Jerry Lee Lewis or all the people I read about when I was growing up, I wanted to see that they were real. I wanted to touch them. I wanted somehow to share my life with them. And so I wanted, wanted them to be on my solo record. So I called everybody and got some, you know, most people responded well, saying, yeah, if we're available and so on, we'll be there. And uh, the people who wound up on the record were available in that two-week period, and the rest couldn't make it. <laughs> actually, the last minute, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, actually, as we were leaving the studio, rented a, his uh, or took his own plane, landed, and was about to come in. I wanted him to play keyboards on Radioactive and do, you know, sort of great balls of fire keyboards that just didn't work out. But the Beatles, yeah, I called them. Yeah, and he got Liza Minnelli instead. <laughs> Okay, I know there's a lot of questions to go, but we're going to have to do one more here and then one back to Paul because we got acoustic unplug coming up. Will the original four ever get back together for even just a tour or anything like that? It's a very bad question, don't. Maybe for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I think it's a fair question, and you know, it, it, from where we sit, there's no question that's invalid. It's all valid, and you shouldn't, you know, rip into each other because if somebody wants to know something, they honestly want to know about it. Thank you. Thank you. And so. And it's not, and none of these, I mean, all these questions have occurred to us, and it's nothing that we take lightly. We, we talk about it all the time, especially me, because I like to talk. <laughs> but the only way we would ever think about getting back together with uh, Ace and Peter is if somehow emotionally it felt right. Right now it doesn't. Uh, financially, it would be very rewarding. You're talking 50 to 100 million dollars like that. And uh, it's not, you know, we turn our heads 
and and uh, don't want to do it only because it would be a sham, it would be dishonest, it would be like going through the motions. I can't tell you how happy we are with Bruce and Eric and us together. It's a joy. It's actually, you know, being in, being in KISS should not be just what you want or not just what we want. It shouldn't be all about business, it should also be from the heart. And we're very happy being in the band today and doing what we're doing. And that's, that's maybe the most important thing. Okay. Uh, you guys are fucking legends, I'll let you know that now. <laughs> and uh, just one small request, man, if you ever run into Ace or contact him, tell him to get his fucking ass down here, because we'd like to see him. Alright. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay, so that's going to wrap it up for right now. These guys are going to be back in about five minutes. And uh, so keep in mind all the tunes you want to hear. Yeah.
Eric's ready to play.
Okay, we'll point again, and if we if we remember the song, we'll do it. If we don't remember, we won't. What? I still love you. Okay. If it sounds like I made a mistake, it wasn't me. It was Paul. Thank you. 
remember the fucking song? We'll do the Austra Australian version. Oi! Believe it! No, it's not it. Wow. Uh -huh.
musical piece. You will hear it again.
listen, um, Eric would like to sing a song that he's never... He doesn't know all the lyrics because he never sang lead on this song. It's called Nothing to Lose. If he fucks up, then help him out. The first lyric is, Before I had a baby. Is that the first lyric?
played this song in 18 years.
sometimes we're down, sometimes we're not. Often we are, though. Some of you want to hear Paul Jim, then we get a list. Wait, we get a list from you that says, songs you should not play. Don't play Cold Jim. So we don't.
talent with the audience. Yeah.